Greetings, survivors of the coronavirus. Happy or quarantine, everybody. Omniscient dead third party entities. Um, from your couch or your bed or your kitchen table or the floor or wherever the fuck you are. Yeah, in your cars, wherever you might find yourself listening to my little these podcast. Are, these are uncertain times and we're all taking this uh, day by day together. Such a sense of community. Yeah, community. yeah. I mean, the, I think times like this bring out the best and the worst in people. Yes, certainly. Most certainly. definitely. The, uh, worst, the worst when you go to the grocery store and people are haggling you for toilet paper. That's the worst. Yeah, I mean, that's panicking. Yeah. Like, I, I think it, it, there's a big issue with the way people respond to, to things. You mm. know, like... No, you're right. And there is, you know, the governor talks about it. Everybody talks about it. It's like there is a fine line between, like, taking reasonable precaution and panic. But, yeah, exactly. You know? I mean, you, you know, well, you're, you should wash your hands. You should, you avoid, should wash your hands. Avoid public places. Don't be having corona parties. But Don't be having corona parties. We just heard that a corona party was busted. In New Over, Jersey. like, 40, was like 47 people got arrested or something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. So... Don't have a corona party. Really. No, apparently now, now not. Now's not the good time to have a party. I mean, it that kid that licked the toilet seat for attention, too. He got he contracted the virus. What really? Yeah. Oh my god. He, I mean, don't. He, Come he on. licked the toilet seat for clicks. Um, oh my gosh! Anything for clicks. I swear uh, to God. I want your clicks, ladies and gentlemen. But I will. We not... want your clicks. Please click so I podcast. don't have to lick toilet seats. Yes. We. <laughs> no. But we are going to do. A little bit of a role reversal here i'm going to interview max yeah so i've been getting a lot of questions lately since the books have come out and music and he's a busy man yeah there's a lot he's always going busy on. he's always got something going on and we want to hear from him today so <laughs> thank that's you why man. he's in the he's in the hot seat and we're gonna grill him no, all right, kidding. all right, yeah, cook me right now. <laughs> give, me, give me the best. The, hit me with your best shot. So man. you just had, <laughs> she just had two books come out, mm -hmm. American Alchemy and How to Cure Depression with Magic Mushrooms. That is correct. Yes. So I mean, I know we're living in you know end times right now, and everything is crazy, and the response might not have been what you wanted but how's the response been so far well the response has been really fantastic for this but you know while you're on that topic i think it's interesting that you bring that up because there's something that i talk about in how to cure depression with magic mushrooms actually uh one of the quotes that one of the doctors i interviewed who i don't name in the book because he tries to keep himself low-key mm -hmm. uh his his exact words to me were we don't die well in this country and it's because when we, we're told we're going to die, we start panicking. And if, instead of dying of cancer, we are going to die of chemo. Mm -hmm. And, you know, is the medicine, you know, what if, if with a 2% chance of living, eventually you're going to die anyway. And not that you should give up on life, but you don't have to agonize yourself to the grave. And it's a lot of that. Uh, it, it's about being mentally not panicking and being in a mental clear mental state and how psilocybin can help lead you to that but uh sorry back to your question sorry to trail no off. no no but how relevant with like the panicking we were just talking about, exactly like, that's why know, i being thought being in that state because it's because like everybody and, and is... it's one of the things psilocybin definitely alleviates is panic states mm. not maybe not in the moment but there's a tendency of people to come back from it with a it, it's why they call it enlightenment, I guess is the word, because you don't see it as being as, I don't know, bad, I guess, maybe. Well, you know, I mean, enlightenment, you know, means everything to somebody else, you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Just, and I think, you know, you definitely delve into what enlightenment means as far as magic mushrooms are concerned. Um so why don't you just take a minute to describe uh, the books for our listeners? Just, you know, a brief synopsis. So, How to Cure Depression with Magic Mushrooms, I guess. Which one do you want to hear about first? Here. Let's hear about, uh, let's hear about American Alchemy first. Alright, so I started American Alchemy 
right after my movie was failing, as my movie was on its last legs. Uh, for most people don't know this, I guess, about me, but prior to writing American Alchemy, I had written this screenplay called Substance about... Basically, it was like my all of my worst qualities saturated into a person, and then his mom dies, ironically, before my mom died in real life. And I don't know if I was, you know, art writers and future shit, but... So I wrote that before my mom died about basically being depressed, and he kind of gives up on his life and just does drugs with this girl, and he just kind of keeps giving her drugs so he's not alone... And it's about feeding each other's addiction, and he overdoses, and it's this whole real tragic... It's like a tragic character. Yeah, it's a, really. it's like a tragic, um... It's like a, it's like a, com, it's like a failed coming-of-age story. Right, very human. Yeah, exactly. Extraordinarily I, human. I wanted to show a broken character, mm -hmm. and I wanted to tell a story that was very real, but I also was in the means of telling. And... I worked with the director, and I worked with some very talented actors that I'm still in contact with. And we ran out of funding for the movie, uh, about eight scenes from being done. And uh, so I didn't have much going for me mm. at the time. So uh, I sunk a lot of money into that, and it hurt. And I still do love that piece, and I would love to go back to it. Mm -hmm. But then I had this idea for... A magical family, kind of like, kind of like Shameless, I guess. Mm -hmm. I wanted to tell the story of a family falling apart and the evils to do with that, and I wanted to do it in the context of magic because I was writing in a lot of like movie stuff, like stuff that could be done re rendered in movies, mm -hmm. and I wanted to explore concepts that couldn't really be registered in movies in this. And so I came up with these seven characters that are really kind of like seven pieces of myself, if if you will. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I started this story before my mom passed away and had finished it the rough draft, well, the, the fourth or fifth draft, uh, right before she died. And I'd sent it to 237 agents and got rejected every time. 237 every single one in the uh in the book in the uh writer's market book oh my gosh wow. uh, and so i mean from that just so yeah it was a blow to my ego i guess you could say um and i was i was you know volatile at the time you know i was still full of piss and vinegar for whatever reason you know life does that to people and so uh i got rejected 237 times for what is now american alchemy which is this beautiful cover by antique freak she's a shout out shout out antique freak and she will we will be working together in the near future it's a beautiful cover it, it really is it's breathtaking um i helped design this basically well i i wrote everything that i wanted in it from the sun and moon tarot card to the seven-pointed star with the alchemical symbols around it to my logos tattooed on her chest right there. Ooh, that's cool. Uh, and I wanted... So, I guess we'll delve into the characters in this book without trying to spoil. Yeah, not too many spoilers. So... we want everybody to check it out. Ash is the oldest. He, uh... He takes care of them, but does it pretty okay job you know what i mean for a 22 year old that's taking care of six kids that his father and mother haven't done their mom's been gone for a good amount of time at the start of the series um sapphire is the second oldest she's kind of like she's a lot i took a lot of inspiration from stevie nicks mm. and like the more softer aspects of my personality whereas ash is kind of like the more masculine energy, I think you would say. Um, and then there's Scarlet, who is basically like a female witch mob boss, and she breaks bad and starts selling magical drugs in the city. 
and that's really fun. That's one of my favorite. I think that's my favorite story so far. It, not story, but branch of the story in the book because it's like, it's like magic meets Breaking Bad meets like old mob stories, and it's right. It's, it's such, cool. That's an interesting concept. That's and it really... takes place in the modern era, and it's she, Scarlet is is my anger and my fury. She, you know, she's like when when Scarlet is mad. I'm mad. You know what I mean? Right. And and the book delves into a lot of dark concepts from, you know, the racism and the homophobia. And that's uh, in King's chapter. So a lot of times I notice, like, characters have a gay best tra- friend trope. And, like, they've kind of shoved gay characters into, like, this being bullied box or whatever. So mm-hmm. I took King and I made him, like, the everyman. He just happens to also be homosexual. And, you know, he's a, he's a jock. He's well-liked in school. He gets good grades and everything like that. He just happens to be connected to this family and all of the bad stuff. Uh, the second, the, the youngest boy is King. He's like an aggressive gamer. And I'll, I'll spoil King's plot because it happens pretty quick. This is what, like, sets the whole family off. So King steals parts from around the neighborhood to build computers Mm -hmm. so he can game for obscene hours a day. And um, one day, he's playing with frayed wire while he's gaming, and he spills monster on the wire and accidentally electrocutes himself. And he passes out, and that's the beginning of, like, his story. And he realizes that he's actually what's called a technomancer, which is, like, a magician, a wizard that's connected to technology. And he didn't realize that, and his soul is trapped inside of a computer. And then he's got to find his body and get back into it, only to find out that he's paralyzed. Oh, wow. And that's like, yeah, that's a little bit of a spoiler in that one. A little bit, but, but the good detail. That's King's story. And uh, the last one, oh, the two last ones, is Annie and Rue, who is like an infant and can't talk, so she doesn't get like perspective chapters. Mm-hmm. Annie is an eight-year-old serial killer. She's, like, the darkest character in the book. Um, she's, like, Wednesday Adams and Jeffrey Dahmer had a kid. She's, like... The, she's that's like in, That's she, fast. She's, she's a much more aggressive Wednesday Adams. Like, <laughs> she, if you... Annie is probably my, like, my favorite in the, that... Her lines definitely give... Us, they give a lot of humor, and it's very dark and creepy and funny, and it's kind of like, yeah, Annie's very much inspired by Wednesday Adams and serial killers because I wanted I wanted a darker Wednesday Adams. I wanted a little girl. I wanted to take a little girl and make her the scariest, most evil thing possible, and she's great. And again, you'll like. Yeah. Right. Well, it just seems like each character is kind of, like, based off of, like you said, like, an element of you, like, emotions, you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. I think... And 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 uh, writing it, you really get in the heads of characters, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that's part of what I love about, like, writing as a, as a practice. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I see the perspective of different characters. I put people in aggressive scenarios like that's it, it, it's why when people ask like like i have opinions on how i would kill people and not that i would ever kill or hurt anybody right. but like i've i've had Full to disclosure. research it for the purpose of writing characters that had to do it and like i i love weird things like that and this book is like the ultimate expression of like teenage angst and parental disillusionment and fantasy magic all in a white trash family in philadelphia it's 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 a very adult harry potter for again for people that might be disheartened by the world but still might need to see a little magic in it and the real purpose of all this is the world ends at book four in the series and you know that the world is going to end we already know that the world is going and you know that four out of the seven children are going to die Oh, wow. Before That's... that. Yeah. And again, the narrator is telling you all of this from the perspective of 
of all of it already happening. Because when the world ends, it doesn't totally end. Wow. And that's like the, the teaser. Dun, 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 dun. So that's So you're gonna have to check out American Alchemy. Yeah, I, I I hope I hope you people not you people. I hope people out there take the time to read it and reach out to Antique Freak for amazing artwork on the cover, like I said, and let me know your feedback. Well, I, that's just one. I mean, there's also how to cure depression with so, magic mushrooms. So this one is a very interesting. I did. I never to say the least. Guys. Yeah, I um, I never really expected to be doing nonfiction. I guess. Really? Yeah, and when I tell people that, they're like, "Wow, really?" Because you talk about so much. So much. Like, like but I I really like very well versed in a lot of different aspects and and a lot of that comes from my writing because i have to learn about things like i have a i have books about like you know you know there's the writer's guides to weapons over there Mm -hmm. you know what i mean that's that's kind of how i look at things like knowledge is applicable having too much knowledge is never going to hurt anybody and you i've just adapted like I'm going to use it for my writing, so I just absorb knowledge consistently. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But I, I think you can apply that to most fields of education and work. Work, mm-hmm. at, Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Just even if you're like a plumber. And I love – and it's not to just to down on, you know. Oh, no. The, the, sure. plumber, the plumbers that have saved my household multiple times. You guys deserve more credit than I do sometimes. Uh-huh. But – it you you can apply knowledge everywhere you know what i mean you just because you know you're a plumber or a a car mechanic or a politician or whatever doesn't mean you shouldn't learn things about baking or like it's good to be well-rounded yeah exactly there's there's no limit to human knowledge so why why turn away from it you know what i mean but anyway this book ryan so it how to cure depression with magic mushrooms the real sto- what a title by the way yeah well it's a grab you title it is a grab you title but i'm telling you it pretty much sums it up right there it um it, it's actually a reference to how to change your mind which is michael Pollan's monumental book on the similar topic really except his is more of an exploration of the history of psychedelics and his own usage applicable to that it doesn't really dive into his hallucinations because he didn't really have a lot of aggressive ones but he did some of the most important research first off i can't think of a more chronological history of psychedelics than the one that he put together for that book Mm -hmm. and he didn't realize starting it that there's like an underground history of like psychotherapists and timothy leary type people that have been pushing LSD and psilocybin and DMT and like chemicals, peyote, Mm -hmm. mescaline, all of these different things for the same relative purposes for obtaining this mystical level of experience. Now, I'd taken mushrooms repeatedly before. I'd taken them with friends, which I don't really recommend anymore. Well, not necessarily not with friends, but not in that context. Right. Like... A lot of people take mushrooms to get high, and I really think that there's better drugs that are worth getting high with, like MDMA, for example. Psilocybin has a high risk for dangerous abuse. And when I say that, I mean in high doses, it can cause paralysis. It, you know, most people can vomit when they're, like... Mm -hmm. uh, Well, it's very common to vomit when you first ingest it's ego death exactly so i can talk about that in a minute but um i guess we'll start from the from the beginning so my mom passed away when i was three agents away from finishing that i was rejected by all of them but i went i was three agents away from finishing that with american alchemy Mm -hmm. my mom died of a heart attack i woke up that morning and i heard my dog barking and i went out into the living room and she just looked weird so i started i started shaking her i started yelling and shit you know what i mean and she needed help so i 
She was asleep. She was laying on the couch. I ripped her off the uh, the couch and onto the floor. And I called 911, and I was like, my mom isn't responding. Uh, what should I do? They told me to perform CPR. Thank you, Mr. Cognac. Uh, I started doing the uh, breaths and everything, and I her, she, like, gurgled, and it still, like, messes me up to think about it because... Uh, so the hot ambulance got there. They defibrillated her, like, three times. And the EMS guy took me into the me and my little brother into the other room. Alex came out while I was yelling at the top of my lungs. I don't really remember. And uh, and they pulled us into the other room, and they were like, uh, "Your your mom's dead. Like you need to call like a funeral home." And I looked at my brother, and I was like, "We're orphans." And for people that don't uh, know me on the podcast, my father died when I was sixteen of colon cancer. Uh, that was a long, slow process, and my mom was very sudden, and both of them hit me completely different ways. Uh, so, I was not doing great after that. Um, I was probably gonna kill myself, at least very slowly with drugs and alcohol. I, I had, I had a lot of disillusionment. I remember my dog was having, like, heart problems at the same time. And I, I was almost ready to just accept death in another living thing. And I, and I, it was stupid. It was very stupid to just, like, not not do anything like that. And and not that, I like, my dog was in danger or anything, but, like, he needed his medication. And my mom died, and I was three days behind on getting his medication. And, like, you know, I, I the house was in a state of disrepair. My mom had been drinking a, an extreme amount toward the end. Uh, after my dad died, she was very, very damaged. So she started drinking a lot and she dated a guy that's a real cocksucker. If you go listen to anger part two, anger part two, my song is about him. He's a prick. Uh, his name is Dan. I've not heard well from him lately, but you know, I don't wish bad on anybody anymore, but he he was very bad for my mother, and I tried to get them away, and it didn't do anything but make things worse. And she had an ulcer that bled, and it lowered her calcium or her uh, not calcium potassium level, and I believe that's what made her at risk. But they they we I couldn't afford an autopsy at the time, so I don't know for sure. Not that it would change anything. Uh, so I was pretty much done with everything. You know, I, I was nihilistic before, and now I had... There was no reason to do anything. Everybody had rejected my book. My movie failed. My mom was dead. Now I was Jack from Substance. You know what I mean? Yeah. The character that I'd written that slowly killed himself with drugs and alcohol was now me. Except I had a little brother to take care of. You know, I had to get custody of Alex, or Alex would have gotten taken to some orphanage or fucking something. So, I had to get my shit together quick... Uh, and I had a lot of people support me, you know, I had a lot of help from a lot of great people. Uh, I, I couldn't have done it alone and I don't think I would want to, no one should. And I'm there for anybody that, you know, might find themselves going through something similar or, or anything at all, really. Uh, so I had gotten psilocybin mushrooms because I just wanted to be high you know what I mean? I'd taken them before for the purpose of getting high. So, you know, they're, it's a little more mild than LSD, usually in smaller doses. Not not in the doses that I'm about to talk about, but we'll get to that in a second. Mm -hmm. So, this was my... I don't really believe in rock bottoms, like I said in other podcasts, but this was probably the lowest I ever intend on letting myself get to. I Knock on wood. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, so, so I had this one giant mushroom and I talk about this story in the book. And again, I'll just unload stories from the book in this. It was this one giant mushroom named King. I called it King because it was one giant fucking four gram psilocybin mushroom, which is a lot. It, a four, four gram doses is a little, is about a gram less than what most people would need for this kind of experience. But this was a big fat fucking mushroom. There's, I've never seen a psilocybin cubensis this big. 
Um, the name fit. Yeah, yeah. So I called it King, and my uncle, actually, who I talk about in the book, um, he was like, I want to take mushrooms. You know what I mean? I just lost my sister. He was the first person I called and the first person that came to my house. You know, he dropped to his knees next to my mom's body. Uh, I've never, I've never seen somebody so broken, like when he looked at his sister like that. And that was his little sister, and he's like struggled with drugs and alcohol before, and it probably hurt him a lot to even just, you know, like my mom was, had everything together for so long. Like it shocked so many people that she was. It's just so world moving. Yeah, exactly. For you exactly. And your family. And and everyone that knew her, just like she was so young. You know what right. I mean? And it wasn't it wasn't anything that that anybody could have expected. You know, it was almost like a car accident, mm. just a heart attack. Uh, so. Um, he was like, "I want to take I want to take mushrooms. Like, you have some. Let me get some." And I was with my friend Adam and my girlfriend Marissa, and I was like, "Well, you don't go in the woods by yourself, obviously." And that back then, I didn't really know what I. I didn't know what I know now, having researched all of this stuff. Right. I knew like a. I knew a lot about drugs. I used to take MDMA at high school parties, and I would stand up on top of the parties sometimes, and I would lecture people about the drugs they were doing at the parties, and what was happening, because I I love the I uh, love really I'm yeah I'm very interested in drug synthesis and the way that they break down mm. in the body. I have always had. A lot of interest in addiction and 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 substance usage. So with this psilocybin experience, everybody else took three point five grams, which again is about it, it, five grams is what you need to take for this dose that I'm talking about. I took four. Everybody else took three point five. So I took it, and for whatever reason, it hit me very very quickly. I think it's because I smoked cannabis marijuana mm-hmm. uh because when you smoke pot on psilocybin it tends to enhance the 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 speed and potency a little bit so i just felt weird like every hair on my body was standing on end and i was like oh this isn't fucking right mm. like i was like i need to go outside i need some fresh air and i went outside and i felt the wind blow and it was like Phew. and i went out and i was like oh shit I need to go back inside. I'm freezing. Yeah, it was just. It was just like the elements. Were yeah, all... it, it, yeah. The wind went right into my soul, man. And I came back inside, and I was like, I don't know what's wrong with me. There's artificial light coming everywhere, and what's happening. And I talk about it in the book now because I can identify the symptoms. And what's actually happening is called ego death. So ego death is when the body and your mind can no longer identify the self or the, the singularity or whatever the fuck you want to call it. You it, it shuts off the default mode network of the brain. And so when you think about psychedelics, you think that your brain gets more active, right? You mm-hmm. think like there's a bunch of trippy lights going off in there, right? That's the stereotype. Right? Most of your brain shuts down as opposed to like when you're sleeping where it's overactive again. It, it, the default mode network of the brain shuts down. So what people are leaning toward is that the, that the brain is actually filtering out hallucinogenic experiences. That, that like you become more susceptible to them when you take the drug because it's shutting down that part of your brain. And these things are actually happening constantly and your brain is illusioning them so you can feel your hand mm-hmm. and stuff. So nausea is a symptom of, of ego death. And for a person that's taking psilocybin and feels nausea – Throw up, let it go, get, get, get a bucket, throw up and lay down and just meditate. Cl- turn on, tune in, drop out. So you're not puking because of the, are you puking because of the taste? Maybe no, it's entirely too, psychosomatic. It's entirely, oh, okay. It's entirely psychosomatic, the vomiting. Um, especially, so I'll talk about it right now. I, I took King, the giant four gram mushroom. Mm-hmm. I'm feeling weird. And I was like, all right, I need to go for a walk, guys. Which is, again, a terrible idea. Stay in one spot. Stay in a dark room with no noise. Again, because you want as close to sensory deprivation as you can possibly get to get this experience. Mm-hmm. Um, be as quiet as humanly possible. And in the dark room. Blindfolded, especially even, so you can get less light. But anyway, 
I didn't do that this time. I went for a fucking walk, and I was nauseous. And there's a street sign, like, up the road. And this was the first time I've ever had, like, a an honest-to-God, true, out-of-body experience. So I walked up to this sign, and I felt like I was going to throw up. And I knelt down like I was going to puke. And I was a ghost, like, above my body, like, 10 or 15 feet. Mm-hmm. Just looking down. And I stood up, and I was back in my body. And I was like, oh god and i was like i think i'm having a bad trip and it like echoed in my world and i was like bad trip bad trip shit 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 and i was like okay so i can't be doing this right now we got to go back to the house right we go back and my uncle is feeling it now everybody's starting to feel it but i'm tripping balls at this point because i it just i'm really susceptible to this thing i guess so I ended up in my backyard and I was really thought I was going to die. Like I saw this horrible black, it came up from the grass. It was like a bunch of little eyes with like feelers and it just started reaching and I fell down and I, I heard this voice. It was like a man and a woman's voice put together and it was like, you have to be okay with it. You have to be okay with dying. And I was like, fuck like i guess you have to be okay with dying with dying yeah and it did scare me and that and it should so like these experiences are are very you are playing with your psych with your psyche right now you are you are going into your subconscious mind and possibly rewiring it you know what i mean this is a delicate thing that you're doing so i heard this voice and it was a very very clear audible hallucination it was as clear as you and me talking today but it was definitely a man and a woman's voice put together. And I know that because of working with, like, sound, I guess. So, and maybe that's why I hallucinated that. Like, there are things in my hallucinations that were very familiar. Uh, so it reached. And I was like, I guess, I guess that's it. I guess I'm dead. And I was, like, so okay with it. It was bad. And I puked all into the grass. And as soon as I threw up, there was, like, this warming red glow that just kind of erupted out of this color pattern. And I saw, like, a skeletal version of myself on, like, an altar. And I threw up this black evil that I guess was my, like, something bad inside of me. Mm. And I I physically threw up and mentally threw up at the same time. And then all of a sudden it got like this warming, glowing color. And I was like baptized on like this altar. And I talk about it in in, uh, my song Psychedelic Rapper. I I was baptized in universal love. That's what I'm talking about in that line. Uh, And and it just kind of spun. And I was like, what the fuck is happening? It was the most surreal experience I've ever had in my entire life. And... And I heard it, it started laughing at me. Like, the voice just was just laughing. Like, a parent laughing at, like, you ever see, like, a kid, like, a video of, like, a kid learn how to walk and the parents, like, joking with him, like, come mm. on, you can do it. Like, it was like that. Except yeah. I was, like, learning how to fly or hallucinate, I guess. And there were, like, these omniscient, I, I, I don't know, geometric thought processes that were outside of my own existence. Like it was a, it was definitely an outside consciousness, I would call it, but I can't, you know, even if it was just an audible hallucination, this, I, I called it God. You know what I mean? I truly did be, like refer to this thing as God and it was, it was laughing and joking with me because it knew that I was fine. And my girlfriend picked me up and I saw like the same veins going through everything, like through the trees and the grass and in my girlfriend and I think that's the happiest I've ever been in my entire life. When I looked at her in that moment and I saw all of these like things everywhere and she was like, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I was like laughing at this point and I was like, I think I'm ready to go inside. And I went inside and I didn't know what I was doing. This was a complete shot in the dark, but I guess I'd just taken too much that you know, at a higher dose, you can't help but lay down and sit in the dark mm. kind of thing. Like at above five grams of mushrooms, most people can't really function function properly. So especially because they can cause paralysis in certain species. 
of psilocybin. Oh. Like, they're, they will render you unable to move. It'll be like a dream state. Again, you'll just be like... And you won't realize it until they wear off. So, I had taken... I went into the, the living room and I started like meditating and I saw this colorful fabric that looks like an Alex Gray painting and that's why I went out and I sought Alex Gray to talk to him about these experiences and I read a couple of his books I went to the Chapel of Sacred Mirrors repeatedly um I did uh Alex Gray is a fantastic guy I talk about him in the book Mm -hmm. um and he kind of helped me register what I'm supposed to do like Alex Gray talks about in his book that like he so he he had a dream that his friend were climbing on this giant head right and it was like this head of hallucinogenic art or whatever and his one friend went to the mouth because his friend was uh a writer and the other one went to the ears because his friend was his other friend was a musician and then alex realized that he was supposed to go to the eyes because he's a painter you know what i mean he's they're all representing the same thing and so that's what I was going to do. I was going to write for that voice that I heard that represented this subconscious that I think now runs between people. And I talk about it in my book. I, I'm under the impression that there's like an un, a currently undetected force that is connecting the human subconscious minds. And it's like what registers certain shared hallucinations and whatever evidence of thought sharing or like... Uh, weird phenomenons that have to do with with uh, with hallucination and, and and it leads to believe of a non-residual consciousness and that's that consciousness isn't coming from the brain but more like a signal that's being perceived from the brain like how they're like how your bot like how there's a cell phone mm. but there's a signal coming to it like a non-residual consciousness um and and you feel that because when you have ego death you do feel like you're outside of your body and that you are thinking outside of your body and i have a friend that uh that identified with a couch on an lsd trip and her ego attached to the couch because when your ego dies you'll it'll attach to anything to not die that's why when you listen to music on hallucinogenics you tend to really get into the music and if the music gets in a dark way the, there's almost no getting back from it at that point Right, and that kind of goes against the whole stereotype of, oh, let's put on some music. Yeah, I'm an advocate of, of yeah. not listening to music while you're hallucinating. And the same goes for, like, Terrence McKenna and Timothy Leary, too. Like, when they talk about it, they're, they're referring to not listening to music while you're tripping because it, it has a tendency to give your ego something to attach to. And it will attach to the sound. And it can go negative. It's more likely to go ne- – you're much more likely to have a negative experience if your ego is given something to attach to. But if you're just forced into your own insanity, things can go good. They can go bad, and you can stop it, you know, there, you, with as long as you're in a medical setting. That's the most important thing, is I think these drugs belong in a, therape- belong in the ther- in a therapy office and nowhere else. Hmm. You should be able like to— Like in a medical setting. Yeah, or a religious setting if, if, you know, shamanic groups want to embrace the psilocybin usage. I think that would be fine, too. Hmm. There's— I talk about it in the book, but it's not a published work yet. Um, there are scientists that are working on dosing uh, Catholics with psilocybin and having priests ordain the uh, Eucharist and everything like that, similar to the Good Friday experiment done by Timothy Leary. And when 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 you have religious people have like things like psilocybin blessed they have increased chances of the experience that I'm about to talk to, which is called the mystical type experience. Mm. The experience that I'm about to talk about really did change my life. Um, in the book, I, do, I, I don't stray away from sharing my beliefs about life and death and what have you. I don't necessarily have... I, I don't claim to know everything, first off. I think anyone that claims to know what happens when you die is full of shit. But... So I laid down on this five gram mushroom trip when I went back inside after I, it had become positive after I'd vomited. I was embracing it. I was laughing. I laid down and there was like this mosaic pattern that was the universe. And it was this morphing geometric shape that was just so incredible. And I found my body doing these weird yogic motions to try and match the shape that was in front of me. And... 
I didn't realize I was doing it until my hands were touching my feet and I had them in my hands. Hmm. And I started laughing again. And when I made a certain shape, I saw life flowing into like this blue gray pattern that was death. And then it came back around and went back into it like a cycle. So things were being absorbed in, so things were dying and being absorbed into the universe, like nutrients and energy, maybe even a soul. And they were just being pulled into this dead area that you could call like heaven or nirvana, wherever, right? And it was all very positive. This was not like a negative hallucination. And out of it came like this rainbow spiral. And it was my parents, my mom and my dad. Hmm. This was again shortly after my mom died. And I couldn't fucking believe it. I, I, saw, I had a full-blown conversation with both of them. They were proud of me, and I talked to them. They were happy, and they looked good. They, you know, looked healthier than they did when they were alive. And it was different. It was very strange. And I came out of it, and I was so ecstatically happy, but I couldn't, like, communicate with my own body yet, so I couldn't, like, talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I realized, like, wait, like, I'm still tripping. Like, I could go back and, like, talk to them again. And... So while I was talking about it, or I went back, and this time just my mom came out of it. And I showed her my tattoo, because I got tattooed literally the day before she died. It was the last thing she did was drove me to my tattoo appointment. Um, and I showed her the tattoo that I got, and she, she looked at it, and my tattoos were, like, given up to the universe. Like, that fabric pattern that was in everything, mm -hmm. my tattoos, like, weren't part of me anymore. They were part of the universe. Or that pattern. And I showed my mom. And she looked into it. And she was able to see everything that I was going to be able to do in my life. And achieve or whatever. And she smiled. And I came back. Right after that. That was like the end of my experience. The first one. And after that I was like. What the fuck man. I was pit. Like there was the first thing in my life. I was so, first off, I was so happy because I now saw this intrinsic happiness and value to things and the value of suffering and, and experience and life and love and all this shit. Like I came back and I was like, the hippies were right. Like, <laughs> right. like the hippies were right. And, and I was like, but how though? Like, how come I can't explain this to people? How come I can't register these hallucinations and what 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 is the collective unconscious mind like what the fuck was i attached to like if there is a de if there is an afterlife like why though or how mm. and how come these near death experiences how come people who are hallucinating and dreaming and having near death experiences how come they're so close no one would answer that question all the doctors i asked would not touch why people who have near death experiences hallucinate and dream seem to have a lot of comparable traits to them because they're all things that are dealing with this subconscious mind. And psychology is just beginning to really delve into... You have to take like a Freudian interpretation. Carl Jung even talks about it. And then Leary, years later, in, you know, in his own way, and he, you know, he kind of blew it up for everybody. In, in some ways, Timothy Leary was the best thing for the psychedelic movement and the worst thing for the psychedelic movement. A lot of people uh, were introduced from LSD to LSD from that, and there's no telling what kind of positive effects he had on the world. But he also put it in the hands of drug dealers. He also, you know, was put it in the hands of people that were going to use it for harm. Mm hmm or, or not take it correctly. You know what I mean? Everybody knows Gary that took fucking a hundred hits and jumped off the bridge. Right. You know, that, that's, that's serious. And these are things that definitely could happen. And that's why you need to have, I, I would call it a trip guide or a shaman, or they call them white coat shamans. Now the, the, uh, the doctors that are administering psilocybin. Right. Well, they had, I saw the other day on 60 minutes, Johns Hopkins is doing clinical trials now with mushrooms, which is, insane yeah i and... talked to um i talked to someone that works on that during this really yeah yeah exactly johns hopkins they're they're somewhat public with this stuff and they're somewhat not mm -hmm. um 
but it's definitely where it belongs. I think the biggest mistake in psychedelic history or in his in in mental health is the one field of science that hasn't really advanced in the last 50 30 years 30 to 50 years hmm. after the 60s there hasn't been much advancement in psych in in psychoanalysis in you know we've we've come up with antidepressants and turned out that they're not as effective as we thought they were and some of it might be placebo. Even psilocybin mushrooms, they might just be a very active placebo. But it changed my life for the better. And there's also evidence of what's called um, neural... So there's what's called neural pathways. So like when you're depressed, you tend to wake up and you do the same thing every single day. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a repeat behavior or whatever. Um this is like you know when you sled is the example michael pollan gives when you're sledding down a hill it lays down you know eventually the more times you go down it wears down a path that's depression when you're going down the hill so long in the same depressed path you're st you're stuck but one mystical type experience is like a fresh snowfall all of a sudden you can reinvent your life based on it and so I had decided that I was going to first off figure out how the fuck that I managed to do this. How did, how did I have this experience? Why? And what what does it mean at least to me? And and in doing that, I kind of opened up myself to a lot of different different things, hermeticism, um certain like certain i I've, I've studied religion more carefully and again i see tr threads of the human subconscious in things now and i realize that that's what i'm what artists really communicate we speak for these things that are kind of intrinsic in humanity and when you're hallucinating they tend to be more of uh, open to perspective um, so essentially, the book covers three trips, three of my hallucinogenic trips, and and all of the the all of the research that went into it, uh, as well as an exclusive section on microdosing. Well, you talk to a lot of uh, scientists and smarty pants people about this, haven't you? Three. I talked to three people, and a couple of them, uh, m most of them, especially, uh, like I said, Johns Hopkins. They're like. A lot of psychotherapists, and especially the underground ones that really, really, really support this, if they, if they say, if all of a sudden they're the psychologist that's for magic mushrooms, then they're Timothy Leary. You know what I mean? Right. There's this connotation. They're like, that they're gonna ruin their own credibility. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And and I realize that there's like a lot of a lot of pretty much known information in underground psychedelic communities that isn't shared like if you go to the psycho not wiki online which is like a like a wikipedia for hallucinations there's things in there that i think are more useful not all the time and i'm not this is not a quote to go fucking dive into there and believe everything that you read on that fucking website mm. but there are aspects of it that that science can't touch with a 10-foot pole like how do you explain to somebody what happens when they get when they see demons eating their flesh you know what i mean you, telling them it's a hallucination isn't going to help. So what do you do? And shamans have an answer to that, but, you know, doctors don't. And, and it opens the door to things like like mental health in medicine. Why, why would you go somewhere that makes you feel sick? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, people go to shamans for healing. People go to hospitals for healing. They have the same purpose you should feel safe in a hospital it should be an inviting welcoming place not a not a white room that makes you you know and and over time i think you know it we will be embracing mental health as part of health epidemics well it's it's i feel like it's not taken seriously no and it's not and it's also At the level that it should be because there's such a shortage i mean anybody who's tried to navigate and get help with you know your mental health issues you know what a pain in the ass it is to try to find a doctor it, and you know what a pain in the ass it is to try to get medication or whatever exactly therapy you know it takes a long time and and 
and the and the fact is and there, so many people suffer in silence there's uh, that's the the main thing and the fact is that there's evidence that this drug can help people especially in the right setting there have been they had a 98% chance of curing alcoholics in three sittings most of them by the second tar- by the second trip um, it, it treats addiction, it treats anxiety, it treats it treats the five leading mental health crises in this country. And post-traumatic stress disorder, which it, it didn't really address my PTSD. I still have a lot of symptoms of my PTSD. Mm-hmm. I smoke cannabis for that. But it did definitely take away my depression symptoms. It did give me a renewed aspect for life. It made me want... It, I saw, like... I saw the value in American Alchemy now, and I saw the value in failing in my movie, and all of these things happened so very quickly. And then in my next trip, I knew what I was doing, I'd done research on it, and I was able to hallucinate for two hours. Mm. And that time, I really addressed my depression. That time, I was able to conv- to get quit smoking. Again, you have to know what you're doing when you're tripping. It's a very active, tiresome thing. It's not a let's take hallucin let's you know smoke a joint and relax or take mushrooms and relax type of thing. This is a very mentally strenuous activity that is very serious. Like you have to go into it knowing what you want out of it. And you need to be around someone that can protect you in the event of an emergency and that isn't some kind of psychopathic cult leader. Because how many people have been susceptible to people like Charles Manson? And how many people have used psychotropic drugs for brainwashing? Mm-hmm. Or, or aspects of that. And again, to an extent, I feel like I brainwashed myself. You know what I mean? Mm. And if someone was in my ear fucking telling me that they're God or something, who knows what the effect could have been. Like, the, these things have a very strong purpose. And the more... the I personally am under the assumption that humans have been evolving with psychedelics for a very, very long time. In particular, psilocybin. Mm. Psilocybin... For whatever reason, these mushrooms develop. Let's, when we're talking about evolution, we things evolve for the. And this is from Paul Stamets' book, um, which is Mycelium Running. It is monumental in the study of mushrooms. Uh, first off, Paul Stamets is, I believe, the first person to actively identify that thirty percent of all soil is fungal. I did not know that. Yeah, the largest species ever alive is a fungus it lives for miles it's a mycelium patch um he identified that mycelium can detect earthquakes and not only detect earthquakes but notify land masses like trees about them um and when things die in the forest mycelium are the first thing that attach to it because they're the fungal spores that cause decay without without mushrooms there's no decay Mm -hmm. so they would rot they sit. They they help human rot and all things rot, and then they divert nutrients through the soil into specific things. This is a conscious microscopic thing, and I talk about. There's a study that they did in Japan. When you think of cells, you don't think of them as being intelligent, correct? Mm-hmm. But they took this green mold slime, right, and they built a maze that was based on the same su- uh, subway system in Japan, right? And they put food at the one end of the maze, and the mold was able to grow not only in the direction of the food, but in the shortest pathway it took to save itself nutrients to get the food. Very efficient. It's a smart thing, exactly. Now, mycelium have this crazy ability to just grow mushrooms based on specific things. So when they take in certain nutrients, they grow certain mushrooms. Uh, the example I use in the book is, let's say, a mycelium wanted deer, right? So mycelium, the mycelium begins growing a specific breed of mushroom that attracts deer to this patch. The mushroom sprouts up. The deer come there. The deer eat the mushroom. Now, why would the mushroom want the deer to do that? Probably so that the deer can, can shit in this patch. More plants can grow. The mycelium can feed off of that. Or maybe the de- maybe it wants to kill the deer. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So the mycelium grows a poison that, that kills the deer and then it can feast on it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It can be a predatory thing. So mycelium, I believe, consciously can create 
specific chemicals for specific purposes. Uh, penicillin is a good one. Uh, why why it exists is hard to say, but I think that humans and nature work together in ways that we don't understand. I think trees get something from us and we get something from trees. So why invent this hallucinogenic compound? And you'd think, well, maybe it kills people. You know what I mean? You, they eat psilocybin and they die. But in small doses of psilocybin, which would probably be more likely to occur in nature, it can actually increase hunting ability, especially in micro doses. Like uh, there is a tribe in Africa that's n not Africa, South America, that is known to microdose their dogs on psilocybin. Really? Yeah. And there's an MMA fighter who Joe Rogan talks about. It's he's not named because this is probably illegal in MMA, but he microdoses before every fight, and he says that he can predict the future on microdoses, and. And you could talk about all types of things like people predicting the future on psilocybin. I myself have experienced things that I would call nonlinear time. Um, it, it, this is where it gets into some woo-woo fantasy theory. But there's two theories of time relatively. There's the A theory of time, which is that time is like, you know, how most people envision it. It's chronological. It's got a beginning and an end. But when you take psychedelics time becomes very relative and einstein even said that time is like a very persistent illusion well psilocybin lsd ego death in general they have a tendency to remove time and if you look at the brain the the brain the default mode network like i said is connected to time and you can kind of experience what i would call nonlinear time i've been at events in the past and again i hallucinated this obviously but a lot of people will hallucinate dying as soldiers is very common. Um, you, you you see time, again, the B theory of time, I think of it as like the pages in a comic book. And in any little panel, it's currently the present, right? Mm -hmm. But when you pick up and hold the whole book, all of it is not, you know, it's all one thing. That That could be time. And our brains are limited to the perspective of singular moments in it we think of things as straight line and we can o and we can only think of things as straight line because we're stuck in the persistent illusion mm -hmm. of time yeah right and, and that's why time is relative possibly mm. um psilocybin there's evidence that it has something to do with human evolution that it ha it creates leadership qualities in certain people um mystical type experiences tend to run in pretty high regard of the people that have them most people will say that it's the most significant event in their life next to uh giving the birth of their child it's definitely the most significant event in my life even more so than being published or finding my mom or things that have influenced me i would not be the person if i didn't have the psilocybin experience that i had it was that profound of it just yeah I, I life changing would, yeah experience. and you would probably say that psilocybin mushrooms have a better uh chance of curing depression than most of your common antidepressants do i don't want to say look i'm not a doctor and i'm not at liberty to say that someone should or should not be on any kind of specific medication okay but I had treatment-resistant depression. I was on Zoloft. I was on Lexapro. I had Xanax. I had um, Adderall at points, uh, but that's not for depression. I had a lot of different different medications for the. It started when my father was dying. I was an angry little pissy kid. I would get into fights. I would, you know, I tried drugs, tried to kill myself before. Um, it didn't work, obviously, uh, and. And, you know, I was hospitalized for that and they, you know, furthered treatment. And I don't, I, I, I committed suicide on medic, tried to commit suicide on medication that warns against suicide. You know what I mean? Right. It's very, it's like, a very fine line. Mm. And there's more evidence that it was placebo that was actually making these drugs work initially because they were a lot more effective in the beginning. And that's why I think psilocybin needs to be addressed correctly, because if it, in the strong event that psilocybin is just an active placebo, 
if it stays in a medical shamanic setting and everybody goes there once it once in their life to get something seriously done and we hold it in a very high regard then it'll be treated differently than oh i'm just on some pills right um i don't want uh psilocybin to become a very common thing because it could lose that that heightened value you know what i mean right you don't want it to be just like oh i'm taking my antidepressant today this morning exactly and and it gets even more interesting when you find out like like all the stuff that i'm talking about all the medical stuff all this stuff was was a lot of it was discovered by a woman named maria sabina who uh the book the book is dedicated to all of the psychedelic people that are my heroes in in this field um she was a mexican woman who used psilocybin Mexicana to treat spiritual problems in her community. She is what's called a Catholic uh, mushroom shaman, if you will. Uh, she uses uh, Catholic symbolism and crosses and the Virgin Mary and stuff to represent certain aspects of hallucinogenic trips. And her, in her lifetime, she dosed John Lennon, she dosed Jim Morrison, she dosed Janis Joplin, Timothy Leary, Aldous Huxley this first time. Um, basically a lot of people started seeking her out for her knowledge about this, this weird hallucinogenic thing. And nobody knows how she figured it out or where it came from, but no one knows. No, she was just a very smart little Mexican woman and nobody like, it's hard to say how long these things have been in use. Um, there's certain evidence in, of past use of mushrooms, even in Amanita muscaria, which is a very dangerous mushroom that causes hallucinogens. It's the red cap one with the spots that everybody sees in mm-hmm. pictures. Um, it, it it arguably might have the most accurate Alice in Wonderland-like hallucination I've heard, but there's a neurotoxin in Amanita muscaria that can kill you. There's this weird guy that was a deacon or a something, and he wrote a book that it started the Catholic religion, Amanita muscaria mushrooms and it was all based on a sex cult and mushrooms and it's a very fun read real or not um but psilocybin it so it comes from cattle right like a lot of it psilocybin grows very well through cattle now there might be other species of psilocybin that don't because we weren't looking for it like in spain or whatever but a lot of evidence says that it came from the new world because we had to bring cattle over there weren't cattle in america prior to this we Mm -hmm. brought cattle to mexico and then psilocybin would have been there but it's hard to really say especially because there's a lot of other species of psilocybin and there's other chemicals that can make people hallucinate too i mean even near-death experiences can be very very profound uh or are very very profound i mean so if there is a kind of thing with ego death and these profound experiences, you go back in history and you see, I talk to God and da 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 da. Some of those people, not all of them, some of them are liars and some of them are crazy. But a handful of them might have actually had mystical type experiences. Wow. And, and when you have one yourself, you see why people talk about them like that. Just these life-changing experiences yeah and again i try to describe it in the best of my ability in my book but it it, you you can't really describe things that aren't seems like it would be a very hard thing to put into writing it is it is extraordinarily and and that was my goal you know Mm -hmm. what i mean right it was going to be it was going to be a task it was going to be a challenge Mm. you know i wanted to be the voice for this hallucinogenic thing and that's another thing with ego death is it gives you like this weird like wow like i i have there is this in like the, even if there's no meaning in life i get to make my own meaning to life you know what i mean mm-hmm. i can i can write a book about mushrooms i can you know make a movie i could try again i could fail you know it 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 gives you a different kind of outlook and that's why i think it treats it like they say uh it's a quote from alcoholics anonymous and alcoholics anonymous was actually started by a guy who uh was saved by an lsd trip which is extraordinary yeah yeah and most people don't talk about that Mm -mm. but his life was saved by an lsd trip and his best friend who actually wrote a lot of the philosophy of alcoholics anonymous never never got really truly sober and he never had that one 
mystical type experiences that the guy that actually found that founded it did. Mm-hmm. There were the two guys that founded it. One of them quit forever, and the other guy kept going back and forth. And the one guy that quit forever had an LSD experience. And LSD is a very powerful compound as well. The, mm-hmm. And I think a lot more people in the 60s and 70s were having very powerful experiences on them because LSD, you could take a lot of it very easily. And at that point, you know, if you're hallucinating that hard, your ego is just going to die. Right. And it, it was it was just a period of experimentation I, back then. I'm a very experimental person, too. It I, was just like I've tried most of the um, the fun drugs, if you will. Mm-hmm. And not, I don't recommend some of them to kids. I don't again when when I talk about drugs, I think that there there's there's a right and people have the right to experiment, but they have to do it safely and you have to do it smart. You have to know what you're taking. You have to know why you're taking it and what you're gonna feel. You should know like, just can't be a party atmosphere yeah. all the time. Psilocybin, no. MDMA, yeah, I would say, and MDMA probably should be legal pot yes pot yeah pot can go anywhere you want it to it's a very friendly thing alcohol pot is like a michael you know, everybody knows michael yeah and and drugs have purposes and there's no doctor that's sitting there saying we should get rid of opioids you know why because if you did there would be a lot of fucking serious problems with pain right like it, it's the greatest painkiller of all time oh, you know doctors we say still that it'll always be in the in the treatment we still program. use cocaine we still use medical cocaine mm-hmm. you know you there you can look it up methamphetamine is still used adderall is used mm. like i i don't really think first off the, i think the problem in this country and the problem with drugs is that we decided at some point that drugs were going to be controlled by the federal government and not doctors Big, big, big mistake. Yeah, it it le- and again it, it led to a lot of very counterculture movements. Meth was sold over the counter, and then one day they told people they can't do it anymore. It's just, so what president do you think, or what I guess, yeah, administration do you think was most directly responsible for Nixon? Nixon. The Nixon administration. Um, Nixon had a big problem with pot in particular. And pot really set the wave for what was going to be illegal because, like, it, no one knew anything about it, mm-hmm. first off. And no one knew anything about a lot of these new drugs. A lot of them were just being invented. Right. So, this and, and it's the same 70s. thing with, like, designer drugs nowadays. You can't really make all of them illegal because you can just tweak the formula and it still gets you fucking high. You could probably eat sunblock and get high. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? You take if you take the right amount, like drugs, and humans have this need to alter their own consciousness, and at some point we decided that this was not normal. You know, mm-hmm. the ideal child in America, and according to the Nixonian way, has never smoked pot, never drank, never had sex. You know, is, is that a, is a decent moral? America. Is is that realistic? Really? Like, think about human history for a second. Think about all the people you know. Like, how intrinsic are these experiences to the human human nature? And is it weirder that we have imposed things that are marriage in itself is like two hundred years old? Mm-hmm. Like, there there wasn't marriage really in the seventeen hundreds, not the way that we see it today, at least. Especially love. The mm-hmm. idea of love and marriage going together is only 200 years old. Mm-hmm. Before that, it was a complete political agreement. Mm-hmm. And at what point are we just sacrificing human experiences for... And again, if you want to get married, that's fine. If right. you want to be with somebody the rest of your life, that's your choice. Mm-hmm. But we've imposed that it's it, you're supposed to do these things. You're not supposed to smoke pot. You're not supposed to... to but you're allowed to drink. You're not supposed Right, isn't that crazy? Yeah, you're 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 allowed to own a gun, but you're not supposed to take hallucinogens. You're, you know, you mm. you're the like and I don't really think that there's anything like you can't smoke pot, but you can smoke a cigarette. Right, cigarettes are fine because and and a lot of and a lot of the legalization still has to do with the fact that they're going to just make money off pot. Mm-hmm. like a lot that's it yeah a lot of it is they're is, not doing it out of the goodness of their heart no no they're not and things that are going to be notoriously harder to control like pot even 
pot can be grown at home. It's like a very easy homegrown plant to an extent. Mm. It, it's going to be hard to control it until they come up with a way to regulate it. Soon, I, I wouldn't be surprised if people can't grow pot in their own property. That's what's going to happen. Yeah. I really think that they are going to fuck over everybody who grows their own shit. Yeah. And that's gonna piss off a lot of people. I think that's really it, it'll wrong. be like it'll gonna, be like alcohol. The hands, there's gonna be like three companies, yeah, like that. Yeah, probably. You know, like there's like there's Bud Miller and Coors. For it'll beer. be like big cannabis, yeah, big, and big and beer, then there'll be like cannabis. small small like home grows like home right. breweries. Then there'll and be stuff. a craft a craft pot. Yeah, like yeah, exactly. I definitely think that that's what's going to happen to pot. Um, I would invest in it in Canadian weed for people that are listening. Oh, they say it's unbelievable. I I mean up it, there right now. It it's it's unbelievable in Colorado. It's unbelievable in Canada. Yeah, like, but the fact that it, they can't have anything on the books because yeah. it's illegal. It's all cash. Right? It's bad. Um, Canada, no, they're they're fine because they federally made it legal. Well, I mean, here all in the, all United, United States, all the money in the United States. Yes, it's an all cash, cash. um business. They have ATMs in most dispensaries. They so the, do. <laughs> so, the, so, like, when I was yeah. in California, I experienced that. You ever been to a dispensary here? Have you ever been inside one? I'm not in Jersey, no. No. Like, uh, Belmar? I've been to uh, the one in uh, Egg Harbor Township. Okay. And it's very, very interesting in there. It smells beautiful when you walk in there. <laughs> and as soon as you walk in, there's a big ATM machine right there. Yeah, there. and and that's what it's about, man. It, and it's a... But but to an extent, I'm not the biggest opposed of that because I know for a fact that if Amazon sold heroin, it would be quality contested. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I have a friend, and we talked about it on the last podcast. Joe DeJoya, shout out Joe. He um he told me that he fucking took a drug test when he was at the rock, like one of the lowest points in his addiction. Like he's addicted to heroin and crack, and he pissed clean. Yeah. What? Yeah, at a UPS drug test. No shit. Yeah, and and is that because of the drugs you, it, were they already out of his system because his body's like that's poison I gotta flush it, or what were they was he just taking not the right drug for the drug test? Mm-hmm. And again, I'm a pothead. I probably haven't been able to piss clean since I was fucking twelve. Right, same here, exactly. And I think that's complete bullshit. They shouldn't have that. And it's and exactly, exactly. It and it's it. First off, it take it's attacking people's livelihood. There's people that are in jail for no fucking good for reason. Just stupid non-meaningful charges and that goes so far every one of those kids that got caught with pot can't be president the last right. four presidents have admitted to smoking pot everyone except trump and uh, tr- uh trump didn't obama did clinton did george bush jr did and then before that and was then i don't um, know i doubt Reagan. fucking the old man yeah, bush Reagan definitely didn't. didn't smoke the pot. old man bush definitely didn't smoke he pot. hell no he did not <laughs> Reagan didn't either. I don't know. Little George, but again, all of them, all of them smoked pot, and all of them backed out on it. But the fact is, if somebody, if a police officer would have arrested all of those people, none of them could have been president. Right, and just and that shoots you right in the foot. Is that not? Is that not stupid? Like, like just stepping back and understanding like how laws work. Even if you think pot is really bad for society, even if you don't want your kids around it, and you think that it's going to ruin. Things like alcohol. Maybe you hate alcohol. You know what I mean? Prohibition had an argument. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it. it's not to say that these things don't fucking have serious repercussions for mm-hmm. society. But is is criminalizing human behavior the right way to address it? I think not. No, and it doesn't work. I mean, criminalizing, you know, alcohol didn't work. And just... The more that you make it illegal, I think the more people are going to do it. Don't you think, to some degree? To some degree, yeah. At least the more they're going to do it unsafely. Like, not safely. Again, Mm. like, uh, heroin is a good example. Fentanyl. The transition of heroin to fentanyl is a good example. Right. Um, Mac Miller, he sniffed a Percocet that that happened to have fentanyl in it, and he died. He's dead. How, how not fair is that, that they can just make pills that don't have the right drugs in them? You know, it, it, if a company kills somebody with something, they're held responsible. Drug dealers, they, they're they not really. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? When you give things to a criminal market, you're just allowing criminals to control them. Like, 
I, I don't understand. And, and another thing is it, it has this inherent distrust of police. Mm-hmm. The reason for a lot of the hatred in police in this country is because police have the right to stop and look for drugs. Right. And if the police can't uh, don't care, like in Amsterdam, I've never felt safer around police because because ecstasy is decriminalized, mushrooms, psilocybin are decriminalized, cannabis is decriminalized, alcohol is fine, and they don't have the right to search you. They don't have the right to violate you. They don't have the right to search you. It's crazy. I saw it's like demilitarized police. This kid was tripping balls when I was in Amsterdam. He was staring in a mirror, touching his face, like zone the fuck out. He looked like he was about to lick the glass. This cop looked at me and then looked at him, and I was like, "Oh fuck, this guy's in trouble." Mm-hmm. And the cop tapped him on the shoulder, and he was like, "You all right, buddy?" And the guy looked at the cop like he had ten heads, and was just like, "Uh huh." And the officer just looked at him and then looked at me and was like. Tch. Amsterdam and kept going. Wow. But like, wow. But, and then I thought about it and I was like, what was that guy really doing? Staring at himself in the mirror. If he was a homeless, and that, how many homeless people have gotten arrested for things that aren't violent, aren't, you know, mm-hmm. things that are out of, you know, their control. And then they get arrested. They have fines to pay. They can't pay the fines. And their and, lives are ruined. And then they're stuck in a system of jail. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's just a circle. It really is. Yeah. And it's vicious. And it and it's preying on the weakest members. Not the I'm sorry, to say addiction is a weak thing. Not, not weak, but it's preying on sick people. Vulnerable. Vulnerable people, the exactly. Most vulnerable members the, of our some society. Some of the most vulnerable members of society, exactly. It is. So what's going on with your music lately? Yeah. Why don't we talk a little bit about the music? Yeah. So um the Kings of New Jersey album is about done. We're, we're finalizing a couple tracks on that and getting the artwork for everybody. Um, I understand the shows have been kind of on pause as we're all on pause right now with the coronavirus. Yeah, shows are on pause for the time being. Um, hopefully we'll be able to do stuff this summer because that's like our best time usually. Mm-hmm. And But we are planning on doing a online Discord concert with some other local musicians and our friend Aaron who... Uh, we made radio for the second time. Ooh. That was cool. We were on Rutgers Radio again. How uh, cool was that? It's fun. It was definitely, it was an experience. We did some live songs and we were rapping, did a little interview. and. Well, you know, when I get to Raw, I'm going to put you on Raw on radio. Okay, let's do it. Let's, <laughs> hey. I'm excited. So I'll send stuff down to Stockton and you'll be on all the campus radio stations. Hey, that's how it like if we can get around you know <laughs> that, that's what's beautiful about about art is it is like once it's out it kind of takes on its own life you know art gets its own destiny mm-hmm. and that's kind of why i just kind of release stuff um well stuff spreads now it's everything's so viral so you know what i mean yeah so i've been working on the new album which is very very like traditional hip-hop inspired it's a lot of like freestyles and like fun Shit that I did with a couple other underground artists, Sue Young, uh, Re, Cam, uh, Reem. And uh, I sent a couple tracks to Redman. He came back. And, and and you got a shout out. Yeah, he's a great guy. He's From Redman. Yeah, it, it definitely gave me some Which clout. is really fucking cool. Um, like I said, he's just a good guy. Like, it, he didn't have to be so cool. To, and to, you just sent it to him. Yeah, yeah. Just, I and mean, what did you expect out? Did you just kind of like expect uh, a shout out? Maybe, and that was maybe it? he would. Yeah, maybe he reposted it. Maybe something. He, you know, he, he. It's cool. It's. I I love seeing artists support each other, and I don't ever want to be at a place in my life where I don't have a footing in the underground. Mm-hmm. Like I feel like a lot of art is pivoting now this is a very pivotal time for artists because it's not as corporate controlled anymore you know what i mean they're starting to call new artists industry plants if they're backed by these big companies and that used to be everybody Mm -hmm. everyone had to be backed by a big name artist you couldn't produce a song now any asshole with a speaker can put some shit on soundcloud and with a recording interface or something and it's got two results it's got it's a double-edged sword it saturates the market and it's harder to get exposed and for people to see you. 
but it also enables people that never would have had the chance. I mean, if Poe could have been posting stuff to Twitter, it probably would have changed his life, Mm -hmm. you know, or maybe not. Maybe he would have gotten swallowed up into the vast void that is the internet and he would have been the same Twitter verse. And how many sad artists are probably swallowed up, swallowed up. Right. And, and I'm working on a piece right now that's going to kind of address the artistic world right now. It's called, you aren't a fucking artist. And then it's got parentheses unless, Mm. and it's like a it's like a counter intuitive self-help book i hate self-help books the I th- self-help book i think they're the dumbest the dumbest thing but this is my some of the most common questions i get and that's why i wanted to do this interview with you is because like how did you get published what made you start doing art when did you start doing art um uh, anything and, and like the advice is i just i just fucking do it you know, I, 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 I operate effectively with no, no idea how, how well or something's going to work. And now I've fallen in love with the failures now, now fallen in love with failures. Yeah. I, I look forward to trying, you know what I mean? Jesus Christ. Like, yeah, I look forward to trying. That's one of the greatest things I think I've ever heard. Yeah. And that's, and I address it in my, in my, in my up and coming YouTube series. Shout out, Shout out the there. future. Yeah. Um, which is another thing, I guess I'm talking like is another project I, I bit that I'm working on. Uh. I'm working on, I'm working on a series of horror stories with Adam. The book is psychedelic, a book is psychedelic horror. Which, oh, nice. Which is going to address like a lot of like, I don't know. I wanted to have like a, it's kind of like an, it's kind of like inspired by it really because it takes on forms of like it's it is just a manifestation of fear and it's this almost like cthulhu like omniscient entity that's just there you Mm -hmm. know what i mean and it's just something that's in people that's just fucking scary and i've always had a lot of love for horror i think that was some of my first some of my first loves of books was horror books so it's it's nice to be doing short stories and horror too now I've I've freed myself up to be able to create to create like again create freely, and fail freely. You know, mm-hmm. like I'm I'm I can I can put out a song that sucks tomorrow and put out a good song a week later. Like none of these things define me anymore. And and when you fall in love with failure, you you can really not give a fuck. And it's a beautiful thing to not give a fuck. And it's hard. And, yeah. but but you know the the quote that i've been going off of and i shared this on my instagram uh so charles bukowski he's like a legend um he wrote he wrote several different books uh anyway when he he spent 55 years trying to get published rejected god knows how many times hard hard life you know, he had to keep going back to work. He was an alcoholic. He struggled. All this shit. And then he died. And he was bu- when he died, he was published. He was successful. He'd finally made it, you know. Mm-hmm. And on his tombstone, he just put the w- two words. You know, his name and the day he died and everything. And don't try. Don't try. Two words. Don't try. And that's it, you know. Because when you try, you get in your own way. You know, you try to be cool, you try to be smart, you try to be funny. Funny people don't try to be funny. They're just funny. Rich people don't try to be rich. They're just fucking rich. You know, you get in your own way when you're trying to be an image of something. You're more complicated than that. You know, you are all of the things that you experience, including the failures. And... And my movie is a great example of that because it is something that meant a lot to me that I learned a lot from and that ultimately resulted in just the loss of money. But, but the gain of, of, of inevitable experience. You know, my film school was on the set. So mm. I got to see things. I got to hear things. I got to see actors perform my work. Right. And that in itself is something I should take away and be proud of. It's not all... Mm-hmm. so we've been at it for an hour and a half so let's get some let's wrap this up soon okay 
Sorry about that. No, right. no. Hey, it's good to have hey, lots right. to yeah, talk about. Yeah, time, went, time it's flew. It's good to have lots to talk about. Well, dude, it was an amazing chance to get to talk to you. Thank you, Ryan. And to I... have the opportunity to just hear you in your own words. Uh, you're a really remarkable dude, man. I've said this before. I mean, you've bounced back miraculously from everything. <laughs> really inspiring and just keep on doing what you're doing, man. I mean, we all love you. It's thank you, thank you. We're all here for you. I love supporting. you guys. I love the support. Um, thank you, thank I, you so much, everybody. Thank you, Ryan. Absolutely. Thank you, Internet. Um, everybody, stay safe. Wash, stay safe during the coronavirus. Wash your hands. Be kind to each other. Be fucking kind to each other. Please be. Don't hoard the toilet paper. Yeah, no. Don't panic. Be safe, guys. Be safe.